Bienvenidos, bienvenidos a todos. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Look around you, is this not cool? This is so cool. Uh, this is like third lunch at Orchard Elementary, actually. And I want to start out by giving a shout out to my amazing leadership team, Becky Pringle, Vice President, <laughs> Princess Ma, Secretary Treasurer, and our amazing six executive committee members. Uh, where, where, are, where are we? Right there, I knew it. From Tennessee, Dr. Earl Wyman. From Mississippi, Dr. Kevin Gilbert. From Michigan, Dr. Maury Kaufman. From California, Dr. George Sheridan. From Wisconsin, Dr. Shelley Krajasek. And from Illinois, Dr. Eric Brown. They may actually not be doctors, but they did stay at a Holiday Inn many, many nights. And it's also a very, very, very big deal that you are here because you have a special business. You are in the business of changing the world, of changing the future of everything. No pressure. And that should mean that you really should start looking at yourself in a little bit different way. Uh, let me tell you how I look at myself. I'm fabulous. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm holding back. I'm, I'm actually, I'm actually uh, more full of myself than, than even you would think. Someone once thought that that was like a shtick that I did for a presentation once. Uh, it's not. I'm really fabulous. Um, and I have always, by the way, uh, been this way. If you can ask my little sisters, they will tell you, yeah, like she thinks she knows everything. And I know that people who think they know everything are so annoying to those of us who actually do. Um, <laughs> I've always believed that you have to believe in yourself before you've earned the right to ask anyone else to believe in you. And I still know people, I don't think any of them are in this room, who still say things like, I'm just a teacher. I'm just a bus driver. You want me to do something about racism? You want me to help elect the next president of the United States of America? You want me to stand up to my governor and call him an idiot in a respectful, nurturing way? <laughs> I can't do that, because see, I'm just a humble, lovable educator. Um, there's a saying in Spanish, humilde de corazón. I have a humble heart. If you are humilde de corazón, I need you to get over that really fast. It does not work for me. I need you to have a powerful heart. I need you to have the kind of heart that knows, right down to your underwear, that you are the future of everything. I wrote a book. My husband, Alberto, um, illustrated it. Coincidentally, it is a fabulous book. Um, and it's, uh, it's called Rabble Rousers. It's about rabble rousers for social justice. If you ever do get to sit in the president's limo, hand him something like that and take his picture. Do you know what he's saying right there? He is actually saying, you're putting me in a crummy commercial? Really? For your book? Really? And I did, really. And I wrote it on a seventh grade level so that practically any congressman could read it. <laughs> and we'll be selling autographed copies during the, during the summit. Uh, there'll be a little uh, booth out there, and I just want you to know all the proceeds, 100% of the $35 that it will cost you for that book, goes as a donation to United We Dream to support our dreamers. And that is my commercial announcement. Um, but here's why I mentioned it, other than the fact that I love that picture with the president. Um, in my book, and this is Alberto's um, portrait of uh, Nelson Mandela, uh, one of my stories is about Nelson and his struggle. This is a man who was personally very humilde de corazón, very humble, but he never confused being personally humble with believing in himself and what he was being called on to do. His words at his inauguration, the first black president of South Africa, 
have been my life's philosophy. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine as children do. Your playing small does not serve the world. Let those words really sink in. There's nothing enlightened about shrinking. Your playing small does not serve the world. Wake up every morning, look in the mirror, be totally full of yourself, and tell yourself, you know, my playing small doesn't serve the world. I'm going to do something big today. Think of a way you will be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, and fabulous. Some kid's going to love to read today because of something I do. These students are going to get to school safely. This campus is going to be more respectful. This candidate is going to get elected. This law is going to be passed because I decided I would not play small. It's not a small thing that you decided to come here. Your names were not pulled out of a hat. You are a very big thing to your association. You are in that pipeline of association leadership, somewhere along the line. Some of you have already been elected to be local or state or national leaders who understand how important it is to continually develop your own leadership skills. And some of you were nominated uh, by your state as emerging leaders who are just ready to fly. And some of you just can't help yourself. Um, Paul Goddard, are you here, Paul? Is Paul Goddard here? He's a local leader from Rockford Education Association in Illinois. And he'll probably be here later tonight. Um, Paul is not normal. Um, <laughs> please let him know that, that I mentioned that. Here is what he wrote to me. Is there anything I can do to be able to attend? I'll wash dishes, I'll bust tables, greet, usher, you name it, just let me in. And I, you know, I just want to say to him, um, this is such a passionate, pathetic cry for help. Um, <laughs> but Paul made it, he made it, and I know, I know that you'll want to know, he did a great job waxing my car. Uh, <laughs> yes, so, and he's not here, but we do have some special gloves for him uh, that we will be handing him later in the program. So we will let, we will let Paul have his special, his special gift. Um, I'm assuming that all of you are as excited as Weird Paul um, at being here um, when he's not on his medication, and maybe that's why he's late. But you are here, I, I have to believe, because you know what has to be accomplished if we're going to accomplish our mission. We have to unite our members. We have to unite the nation. We have to inspire each other. We also have to inspire communities outside this organization to stand with us. And we have to be able to lead in a fabulous way. And to unite, to inspire, to lead, we have to use the power that we already have in our own hands. This is power that no governor can take away from us. This is power that no Supreme Court can take away from us. We have to learn how to use the power of our own voice. Remember in the 70s when they experimented with open classrooms? You know, big old open classrooms with big old loud kids and teachers and paraprofessionals. Uh, that did not work for me. Because um, I was going to break out into song if my kids got a little wiggly. We were going to sing, don't stick your finger up your nose because your nose knows it's not the place it goes. And we sang it with dignity. My colleagues insisted 
I think they actually took up a collection, uh, insisted that I have a door that they could then close. And that was not a bad thing. I needed my big old voice. I needed to be able to like shout and sing and, and be loud with my kids. I made a very big impact on my 39 students. Um, but no one outside my wall really heard me. Not until I joined that voice with others. Not until I discovered the power of a collective voice of passionate, argumentative, creative, fearless colleagues, other educators. It was the difference between me sitting uh, with my friends at third lunch and complaining about having 39 kids in my class and then sitting at a Utah Senate hearing testifying about how my class size was impacting my ability to build a personal relationship with my students, how it was hurting my ability to serve the whole child. And back, way back then, we won Utah's first class size reduction money. Where's Utah? Hello, Utah. Yes. Um, we won that because of our collective voice. We're here today this weekend to learn about the power of our voice, our individual voice and our collective voice, that union megaphone that we have. We're here to learn new ways to do big things with that voice. Everything that you're about to experience in the next two days, and it's amazing, is consciously, carefully designed and aligned to give you something not just to memorize, not just to learn, but to examine, to hold it, to chew on it, to reflect about what it means or what it doesn't mean to you. You know, the reflection part is the learning part. It's all connected to develop you as the type of leader that's going to need to lead this organization in a world that 20 years ago no leader amongst us could ever have imagined. You're going to need to begin to unthink some of the things we've always done and the ways we've always done them. You're going to have to invent new tools to advocate for our students, to fight for our members. Um, I've looked over what you're going to be presented, the workshops, the sessions, the activities even out in the hall. There's no place you can step to uh, two paces um, without bumping into something that is, you're going to find is amazing. And we have some amazing leaders to thank for this very cutting edge conference uh, led by our summit design team by Becky Pringle. Where's Miss Becky? Right here. Uh, 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 uh. And if you helped Becky on this design team, whether you are staff or leaders, please stand and let us be in awe of you. All over. When we're finished here, we're going to take uh, we'll, our uh, state um, sessions. You're going to come back tonight, and you are going to hear uh, a general session with an artist, Eric Wall. He's going to create art for us. I understand someone might be taking his art home with him, so watch carefully the art that he creates uh, as he is talking to us. You will never think of a keynote speaker in quite the same way. We'll wrap up on Sunday with our own secretary treasurer, Princess Moss, who's going to introduce us to Bertice Berry, an author, an educator, a sociologist. And she's going to talk about how to take our commitments and turn them into action. When she's finished, Princess is going to lead us through what we can do to take the commitments that we're starting to build this weekend, we have them in our heart, we have it in our head, how do we put those commitments in our hands and turn them into action? And I want to take a little bit of time to talk to you about what we'll be doing tomorrow. It will be something very different, very emotional, maybe even uncomfortable, because we have a very special responsibility in this matter because we're educators. You know that every oppressor throughout history 
has used education to hold down the oppressed. Women weren't allowed to go to universities. It was against the law to teach slaves to read. Education has been a tool of institutional racism. And educators must be the ones that eradicate it. I've asked Becky um, at the beginning of this year to take the lead on this work. Uh, she has many, many good people working with her. She's going to lead the discussion tomorrow. And she asked that I take a minute just to help you understand why we're doing it and what we hope to accomplish. We won't be talking about hearts and minds and how we can all become more accepting individuals. This is very different. We want to explore the impact of the way an institution, an institution like education, can be structured so that it actually advantages one race and disadvantages another, whether it, it, meant, uh, it meant, was meant to be that way or not. It's in our history. Education budgets were built around the property tax. That sounds fair, uh, except that that structure guarantees if you live in a suburban community, which is mostly going to be a white community, you'll generate more money. And if you live in a poor community, which is still generally a minority community, the same effort will generate much less money for your schools. Higher education institutions, by design, advantage families who already know how to navigate the application system. Mom and dad went to college. They started a savings account when baby boy was born. The systems don't give kids in very, very different circumstances what they need to succeed because some kids need things that are very different than others. We live in a culture that still believes, you know, all you have to do is work hard enough, you're talented enough, we all have an equal chance to make it. And I want to challenge that and that's uncomfortable. There are studies that show that executives tend to hire and promote people who look like them. In your head when you think of an executive, are you thinking of a man or a woman? Systems are built around the dominant group and those systems have certain assumptions. That you have a car, that you can walk upstairs, that you speak English, if you don't belong to the dominant group, institutions can actually be obstacles. And each of us belongs to many, many groups. Sometimes we're in the dominant group, and sometimes we're not. So I want to do an exercise. I want to name two categories. I want you to think about which of those categories is dominant and whether or not you're in that dominant category. Meaning, uh, dominant meaning, uh, who primarily makes the rules? Who's in charge? Uh, who holds the overwhelming positions of leadership in that group uh, in, in today's society? So you ready? First one, men, women. Who makes the rules? You know what? I heard a lot of very high voices say, men, yes. <laughs> So, give yourself a point in your head, give yourself a point if you're in the dominant group, okay, and you know who you are. Think about how the world is arranged now. Next group, at least one parent went to college. Neither parent went to college. If you separate the world into those groups, who's in charge? People whose families, uh, parents went to college or people whose families didn't go to college. Give yourself a point if you're in the dominant group. Think about this one. You were raised speaking English. You had to learn English as a second language. And thank you, those of you that are reading. Okay. So think about it. In our society, People who were raised speaking English, people who didn't do well in an English class, people who had to learn 
English as a second language. Give yourself a point if you're in the dominant group. Let's do one more. White, black, brown, American, Islander, Asian, Pacific, uh, Islander, uh, Alaska Native. Um, or white or people of color. Which group primarily makes the rules? We could go on. People with disabilities, people who live in poverty, but you get the point. So think about your points. Um, when we're in the dominant group, it gives us an edge. People in that group see us as belonging. They're more welcoming. They assume good things about us because we look like them and we live like them. And if you're not in the dominant group, people tend to look at you and wonder how you got there. Even if you're successful, you're seen as an exception to the rule. Now, I really hesitated doing this exercise. I will tell you, a friend of mine ended up with lots of lots of points. And he said, well, thanks, Lily. Now I feel like I did something wrong. I feel guilty. Um, and that's not the point. Um, it won't be the point tomorrow. This isn't about guilt. This is about awareness. It's about all of us in this room, white, black, brown, educators, leaders, challenging the institutions that were designed around that dominant group. It's about educating ourselves on the ways to see where the design of an institution like a public school or a university may actually be an obstacle to some of our most challenged students, our most vulnerable boys and girls. It's about our responsibility to act, to lift up all students so that when we say what we really mean, all students should have the opportunity to succeed, that it's not just a slogan, that it's something we're actually working towards. It's that we truly begin to build our institutions around all students, knowing that each student and each community may need something very different. Focusing on that work touches on so much of our core work. And I know um, that in that decade of test and punish, charterized and privatized schools happen mostly in minority communities. Push out programs happen mostly to English language learners. Uh, students who didn't speak Ang uh, English well uh, surprisingly did not do well on standardized tests given in English. Yes, I too was shocked. Uh, something like a culture of high-stakes tests has grown into its own little institution that has racist implications. Since I brought up high-stakes testing, may we take one moment to mourn the passing of No Child Left Untested. <laughs> Wow, you guys are really fun at a funeral, I bet, you know? AYP is dead and gone. Our national nightmare of uh, No Child Left or my um, hit single, If We Have to Test Their Butts Off, There'll Be No Child's Behind Left, um, is gone. And now we replace it. We replace it by something that will be developed on the state and local level. The Every Student Succeeds Act, ESSA, calls for a dashboard of indicators of student success and access to service and supports. Never before have we had to measure the access of a student to service and supports. And it requires by federal law that we the practitioners, the people who know the names of the boys and girls we're serving must, 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 may I say must, have a voice in determining those state and local measures. <laughs> if we can build a system around the needs of every student, not just the dominant group, 
Then we move towards the whole child, teaching and learning in the whole child world. That is my dream. This is our chance to use every student succeeds to move towards that opportunity to learn. The final decision on whether voices of educators, on whether we are heard, we are respected, will be a political decision. So let me put it in the room uh, right now. Let's talk about politics. And I know that when we do that, um, it's, uh, it's always a little strange. Thankfully, when we talk about politics, we always agree uh, on everything. We're gonna, and we're going to have a, a political uh, opportunity. There will be several chances if you'd like to volunteer for a phone bank or something like that. Completely up to you. Completely up to you. But I want to talk to you about our collective political voice um, and using that voice to move the political debate forward forward towards the ideals of our country, towards freedom and justice and equity and a fair shot for every blessed child. And what I'm going to say will sound very partisan. So I want to just go on record, and you can quote me, that some years ago, a Republican personally gave birth to me. Okay, some of my favorite family members are Republicans. We, we, we love each other. And when I was president of the Utah Education Association, we supported a Republican candidate for governor because he was the best candidate positioned to strengthen public schools. We're involved in politics. We care about who our governor is. We care about senators. We care about school board members. And we look at issues. We look at candidates. We look at the strength of the people that we need to support public schools. We need to look at who's going to be taking on the people who don't support public schools. And at the risk of sounding partisan, let's just take a look at who I think is the other side. Marco Rubio says that the teachers' union wants to kill scholarships for poor children, meaning vouchers. Ted Cruz. Closing failing charter schools is about pleasing union bosses. John Kasich says when he's king, he wants to abolish all teachers' lounges where we just go to complain. Ben Carson says the best education is homeschool and then charter schools, and we're failing kids by protecting the education unions. Donald Trump says there's a high union wall that makes schools a competition-free zone. One of these candidates will be the Republican nominee. And if you've watched the debates, they don't like each other very much. <laughs> what they hate more than each other is us. They hate us. I'm kind of proud of that, you know? Um, And they all say that if elected, that they would make us the United States of Wisconsin. They would silence our voice. They would privatize public education for fun and profit. They have denounced the NEA and education unions at every opportunity. They are running against us. For none of them, for some reason, uh, was interested in interviewing uh, to be considered for a recommendation uh, by the NEA. Um, we have two friends on the other side of this. They were both recommended NEA candidates in their last uh, Senate races. What distinguishes them to me is experience, a lifelong dedication to issues of children and families, and strength in taking on the other side. I remember in 1994, after President Clinton had just been in office a few months, he decided to take on one of the toughest issues of the day, national health care. 
I served on NEA's uh, healthcare task force. We came out in full support of that effort. And while most first ladies take on very important issues, nutrition, uh, being a better reader, uh, just say no to drugs, these are important, but they're usually chosen because they are not controversial. I remember seeing First Lady Hillary Clinton sitting in front of a congressional committee, taking on the for-profit healthcare industry, taking on the pharmaceutical lobby. They threw everything they had at her. They tried to tear her apart. I think they've been trying to tear her apart ever since. She stood up to them, and she fought for us. She fought for so many of the students that we serve. And it's true, she did not win national health care. She went back to the White House, she took a deep breath, and she charged back up uh, Capitol Hill, and she said, let's take a piece of it. Look at all those kids whose parents make too much to uh, qualify them for Medicaid, but they don't make enough to really afford health insurance. She came back and pushed legislation with Senator Ted Kennedy and Senator Orrin Hatch for those kids that fell in the middle. And by the way, that's a lot of our ESP families. That's a lot of our adjunct faculty members on the university level. Her fight resulted in the first major national health insurance program since Lyndon Johnson signed Medicare. Six million low-income students today, children today, have health insurance through the CHIP program, the Children's Health Insurance Program, thanks to Hillary Clinton sticking her neck out for those kids. She's been fighting for us for full funding for special ed, She's been fighting for our dreamers, for fair pay for women, for the rights for unions to organize and collectively bargain. She's consistently listened to us. And she's made children and families and education the centerpiece of her life, not just a campaign. She has a heart of gold and a backbone of titanium steel. This is a good combination. And for this, our PAC and our NEA board took the position to support Hillary Clinton in the Democratic primaries. The next president of the United States may be appointing two or three Supreme Court justices. The next president will appoint secretaries of labor, education, health and human services, the next president is going to decide if we continue protecting our dreamers, our retirement security, win a living wage for every worker. And I want the strongest possible candidate to take on the inevitable Koch brothers candidate. They will have $1 billion to throw at this election. We can't give Hillary Clinton $1 billion. We're going to give her something better. We can give her our voice, our collective and individual passionate voice. We can help our own circle of influence understand what's at stake in this political world and why we have to be part of it. And yeah, I know it's not popular, it's not easy, I know it's controversial, it's not comfortable, but there's too much at stake for us to be afraid. No matter what touches you in these next two days, if it's politics, if it's institutional racism, if it's organizing for action, remember to face your deepest fear. Remember the words of Nelson Mandela, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. You're playing small does not serve the world. 
You are meant to shine as children do. We are here to shine. You are here to shine. And I welcome you, hermanos y hermanas. Bienvenidos and welcome to an amazing experience. Gracias.